Hello everyone. My name is Shadan Farasat and I am an advocate who practices in the Supreme Court of India. Today we are going to discuss the Prevention of Money Laundering Act and the recent judgment of the Supreme Court which upheld the constitutionality of all the provisions that had been challenged. Uh, my talk is going to be effectively in three parts. Firstly, what is this Prevention of Money Laundering Act which in short we'll call PMLA? What was the challenge in the Supreme Court? That's the second part. And thirdly, how the Supreme Court dealt with it and what are the problems with the way the Supreme Court in effect has approved the act in completion. Now, coming to the first part, what is Prevention of Money Laundering Act? So, it creates a new offense called money laundering. Now, money laundering has been defined as engaging, in short, with what is called proceeds of crime in any manner. That is how it's been defined. Now, proceeds of crime is something that is not itself covered under the PMLA. The crime of which the money is a proceed has to be under some other act. Normally, it will be a provision of IPC, it could be cheating, or it could be something under the Prevention of Corruption Act, for example. Now, once that crime has happened and money has flown from that, and those proceeds are engaged in any manner, then the offense under PMLA happens. So, the PMLA offense is really predicated on another crime which must first occur under some other enactment. And that is why PMLA of its own does not really have an existence. It exists on another crime being committed prior to it. And that is quite important in the eventual analysis because what uh, happened in this case was that there were a whole range of sections in PMLA which pushed a lot of draconian measures into the act and I'll come to that in a bit. But the main ground of challenge before the Supreme Court was that in the main crime, which is the which is for the purpose of PMLA is called the predicate offense. It could be a cheating offense in IPC or like I said, it could be something under the PC Act. Now for predicate offense, all the criminal procedure, normal procedural safeguards to the accused are available. Normal bail is available. There is no reverse burden of proof. There is no uh, self-incrimination. That is the right against self-incrimination operates fully. You have a right to a copy of FIR. So all these requirements are fully complied with. But when it comes to a offense which is a consequence of the predicate offense, that is offense under PMLA, there is, you know, all these rights are just not available because they have been taken away by statute. So the fulcrum of the challenge was that this in a sense, I mean, the taking away of all of this violates Article 14, Article 20, 21 of the Constitution and effectively in different ways completely takes away the entire realm of fundamental rights which are available to are accused in any uh, in, in the Indian criminal justice system as validated by the Constitution. And uh, in this respect, what was the specific challenge? Uh, I will just sort of put it in a nutshell. There were five major points. And the first point really was that the, in these cases, PMLA, the prosecution agency is what is called enforcement directorate. And there is something called an enforcement case information report. For short, that is ECIR. And what happens is that unlike a FIR, although effectively ECIR is like a FIR, it's the first uh, written report of a crime having been committed under the in, under a particular penal statute. Uh, the copy of ECIR is never given to the accused. In fact, it is not even clear whether if your name is there in a ECIR, you are an accused or not, because there is something subsequent which is a complaint under the PMLA, which is really speaking equivalent to a charge sheet. But the way the prosecution agencies have argued is ECIR is an internal document. And complaint is when really the proceedings begin. So in this phase between your filing of an ECIR and the complaint, a person who is an accused can be an accused, but he wouldn't know if he's an accused. He can be summoned by uh, the ED. He, and most importantly, he can under Section 50 be asked questions which he is supposed to answer on oath like he's uh, before a judicial forum. So he can effectively be self-incriminating himself without even knowing if he is an accused or not. And uh, you can understand the levels of constitutional law problems with a provision like that. So that was uh, part of the challenge that this whole ECIR business when combined with some of the other provisions like Section 50, which effectively allow the officer to make you incriminate yourself, uh, is complete giveaway of all the constitutional protections which are available under Part 3 of the Constitution to a accused. So that was one ground of challenge. Then the second ground of challenge was really um, 
what is uh, you know the bail provisions which is also there in some of the other statutes in different formulations the wordings keep on changing but really speaking if the public prosecutor opposes the bail and then the court has to be satisfied that the person is prima facie not guilty of an offense before granting him bail now as you can understand this is a very high threshold to meet at the stage of uh, you know bail when uh, it's all the prosecution's case how does anybody show that he is not guilty of an offense based on only the prosecution's documents it's literally an impossible ask i must say that this is not the first time such a provision is there provisions such as this have been there in ndps a milder version is there in uapa so it has been there in indian statutes it was in it is really speaking in pmla all these provisions seem to have come together in one statute although snippets of this you can see in different acts at different points in time under indian law uh, very often they have been approved by the supreme court in the past as well so that is your bail provision then you have in effect the reverse burden of proof which is under section 24 if there is uh, 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 if you have been accused under section 3 which is the main money laundering section then it is for you once it is shown that this proceeds of crime it is for you to show that the money was untainted so let us understand what this does the entire proof under the act is shifted on to the accused because proceeds of crime is happening under not the pmla it's happening under the other act like the you know ipc or the pc act so once somebody succeeds the prosecution agency will succeed in showing that there was money used in in money which flew from that crime which came from that crime then the entire burden under pmla under section 24 is really on the accused so it's a complete reversal of burden of proof which is quite unusual there partial reversal of uh, reversion of burden of proofs which we have seen in the statutes that is the prosecution shows one or two things in a particular uh, uh, in a particular provision and thereafter the uh, the reversal happens of the burden of proof here for this act the entire burden of proof is in effect on accused so that was another provision which was challenged and then there was of course the uh, uh, sentencing provision there is one sentencing provision section 4 which does not differentiate between different levels of involvement whether you are the main accused whether you were actually committing the crime whether you are a better conspirator etc so there is no gradation actually uh, at all and that you can understand from a sentencing perspective is obviously very uh, very very uh, violative of article 14 principles and seems prima facie arbitrary now what did the supreme court do uh, effectively the supreme court uh, in its judgment has approved all these provisions and constitutional and the fundamental fulcrum of the reasoning which is repeated throughout the judgment is uh really the legislative the what the supreme court picks on to justify each of these provisions is the legislative intent behind this uh, enactment which is according to the supreme court to wipe out money laundering in all its forms there's a international treaty which india has a signatory to there's global consensus and therefore since the intent is so strong all these provisions somehow get validated that seems to be the fulcrum of the reasoning uh, the problem with that reasoning really speaking is that legislative intent can only be a beginning point of a constitutional analysis it can't of itself be a end point of the analysis it can give you that a basis that okay state had a legitimate basis to enact something but whether that enactment then is in line with due process constraints put by the constitution will have to be specifically tested against those constraints as value as as espoused and you know developed in different judgments be it article 14 uh, 20 21 etc now that kind of that, that analysis is really um, for most part in the judgment is just missing and therefore what has happened is that the supreme court in this judgment has in effect elevated the level of legislative intent to uh, to a level uh, the the principle of legislative intent to a level where it really stands as a, a mechanism which can validate any provision as constitutional irrespective of whatever due process defects which may be there in that act and here you can imagine i mean just imagine a person who doesn't who has been arrested who, uh, who doesn't know what is contained in the ecir who may have been given some basic uh, you know uh, charges of arrest but he doesn't know what is there against him in the ecir he doesn't even know if he's an accused he is being made to sign uh, documents on oath uh, and he will have to prove himself innocent at trial now imagine that effectively violates every canon of principle of fairness in a criminal prosecution as we've all learned right from law school onwards to in the profession but by using legislative intent as the basis the supreme court has broadly validated this completely 
and I think that is hugely problematic because that effectively turns the law on its head. And as I said, legislative intent can only be a beginning point of analysis to give a court uh, understanding that okay, legislature had a reason to act it, but whether it is proportional, whether it is arbitrary, whether it actually is completely takes away any semblance of balance of a fair trial, those are all aspects which will have to be independently examined from a real world perspective, which unfortunately in this judgment, the Supreme Court has not really done. So I hope um, because with this judgment, the, uh, the enforcement directed is uh, quite well armed now uh, to go ahead with the kind of things we have been seeing around. So I hope that this judgment does not uh, uh, stand uh, as valid law for too long. Hopefully that, uh, you know, in not too distant future, uh, Supreme Court will see the kind of problematic uh, 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 chain of events which a judgment like this will lead to and hopefully will correct what in my view and respectful submission is clearly an error. Thank you.